discuss the risks posed by herbicide carryover, I would like to welcome Provincial Weed Specialist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, Clark Brenzel. Clark. Thanks, Dallas. Yeah, the herbicide carryover is kind of a hot topic right now and, and largely because of the, some of those statements that were made in the fall by the, the egg chem companies. Um, hopefully we'll go over some of the background on why that is and 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 what's what's the rationale behind some of those changes to those labels. So essentially we first started kind of picking up on herbicide carryover back in the early 2000s, uh, started around 2002, 2003 in that time frame. And so what we ran into is fields like this where uh, it was a pea field seeded across two previous crops. Um, and we ended up with one side looking a little bit different than the other side. So on the left hand side here, we've got sorry, uh, uh, I, I, I just don't I don't see your uh, uh, screen there. Okay, we must have to share the screen again then. Yeah. Okay. There we go. There we go. You must have punted me when you started your screen up. Yeah, I think I did. Okay. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, on the left of this field um, was a flax field. And essentially on that flax field, they had a group one uh, graminicide and uh, buckulam treatment. So really no residual treatments on it. And on the right-hand side was a wheat field with Everest in it. And this was one of the first times that we'd actually seen concerns about a uh, recropping of a uh, uh, after herbicide following a dry period and, and following dry conditions. And, and as a result, we ended up with some of these goofy things showing up. And that's when we started deciding to figure out uh, what was going on and, and try and uh, get a handle on how, uh, how some of this stuff was taking place. And so th this is a comparison of the peas on the left-hand side with the peas on the right-hand side. And so essentially the, the ones that were affected by Everest were also, they had white leaves, they had, they were stunted in growth, they had sort of typical group two symptoms as well. So we, uh, we, we kind of had an, uh, an idea that it was more of the moisture conditions that were causing the problem. So what we're really worried about uh, is like, what are things, what's gonna happen next year and what's gonna happen to my crop and what's gonna be the impact on my crop for next year. Well, to start with, we have to go back and look at the herbicide that was on that field uh, last year. And depending on the herbicide, if it's got uh, multi-year crop restrictions on it, you may have to go back into 2020 or 2019 even um, to determine whether you could have risks of carryover that have followed through these, this many years into, uh, into the future. The other thing we have to look at for each one of those herbicides that you're looking at that has potential residue is what's the rotational crop sensitivity. And so if we take the case of uh, the pulse imidazolinones like Solo or Odyssey, essentially we've got a range where the mustard family is very sensitive to those. Then we kind of go into flax is net sensitive. Then we kind of go into the small seeded uh, grass crops like canary seed. Then we end up getting into the cool season uh, cereal crops. And in, even within there, there's some breakout where oats are more sensitive than durum, which is more sensitive than barley and more sensitive than spring wheat. And then of course your clear fill crops are gonna tolerate uh, fairly, fairly substantial carryover uh, without any problem those crops that are bred to be tolerant to it, essentially. Um, each herbicide has its own breakdown rate. And regardless of what resistance group or mode of action it is, uh, every herbicide is different. And so as a result, you're going to have a different timeline for how that thing is going to break down. The other thing that comes into play is your soil organic matter or clay. And essentially that's referred to as the buffering capacity of that soil. 
And essentially the more organic matter and clay that you have in that soil, those components act kind of like magnets. And what will happen is that when you have slightly polar compounds uh, in your herbicide, those, those herbicides will stick to, the, to that uh, charged particle in the soil. And so a good example of that is glyphosate. You spray it on and then it's, it's in the soil and it's actually got a fairly long half-life of about 47 days but it's not available in the soil because it's stuck very strongly to those soil particles. And that's gonna depend on what herbicide that we're talking about. Um, it's, it, each herbicide has a different capacity to stick to those, um, those components in the soil. So uh, that's an, an element. Um, and that buffering capacity can either be your friend or it can kind of be your enemy in some respects in that it can impact the breakdown rate uh, of that herbicide in the soil um, by if it's stuck to that soil, like with glyphosate, it's stuck to the soil pretty strongly. And so it doesn't allow a whole lot off into the soil water to break down where the microbes are uh, to get broken down. And so it can slow that breakdown that way but in the year that you're growing your crop, it can be your friend because it, it is stuck to that soil. It's not going to be easily flushed off into the soil water where your crop can access it. And then soil pH impacts the breakdown of the herbicide in some cases. So if you've got pr products that break down through primarily a uh, process called hydrolysis, uh, then pH can impact that. And the other thing that pH can do is it can impact the way that buffering works in the soil too. So it may make your herbicide a little more charged or a little less charged, depending on what, uh, what direction we're going. We find that say imidazolones are, are very strongly bound to some of those particles in the soil in acid soils, but in soils that are over about six and a half for pH, uh, that binding is not impacted at all. So they're more available for breakdown in those situations. And essentially all of this happens normally. This is kind of what's going on in the normal situation, right? And we, it's all kind of going on in the background, but we don't really have to pay much attention to it because when, when it is normal, we can predict. And that's essentially what we want to do is to be able to predict what we can plant in any year after we apply a herbicide. But what kind of gets in the way of that is our environmental conditions. So weather plays a big role in that. So if you've got decent growing conditions for that crop that you're going to grow in 2022, um, sometimes that crop being very vigorous and healthy can outrun that herbicide injury. The other thing that can happen is that herbicide injury often shows up a couple of weeks after a big downpour of rain in, the crop, in that crop year. And so that's liberating all that stuff that's stuck to those soil particles into that soil water where your crop roots can pick it up. Uh, the other thing that weather does is it impacts the breakdown of the herbicides. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit, but it's essentially we require moisture for breakdown is what the end message is. The other thing that plays a role is that we have other things that are going on that are crop stresses in the year that your crop is growing. And so you've got things like diseases and insects and fertility and things like that, that can impact the vigor of the crop and whether it's able to outrun that herbicide injury or not. And all of those things are also affected by weather. So it, this is a big jumble of mess. And so it really makes it difficult to predict with any particular level of certainty as to what is going on in any one field. So it's, it's a bit of an educated guess kind of uh, arrangement. So these are the two major pathways of, of breakdown in soil. We'll talk about the one on the right because it's kind of got the animation going there. That one's called chemical hydrolysis. And essentially what you've got there in the bottom left is a water molecule coming in, splitting that herbicide molecule in half and essentially deactivating it from the herbicidal perspective. Some of the components may have a bit of herbicidal activity, but not to the degree that the original molecule would have. Um, you'll find that this is a 
primary pathway for a lot of products in the group two sulfonylurea um, group. And um, whereas others in that group two category, other subgroups within group two, largely break down through the other pathway, which is the microbial activity. The other group that is prone to hydrolysis breakdown is uh, things in the group five family. So things like uh, atrazine that would get used on corn or simazine that would get used in, in non-crop situations and things like that. The other primary pathway is uh, microbial activity. And essentially what happens in the soil is that these microbes start cleaving the molecules apart that are the herbicide molecules and they use those smaller components as a source of energy and the bonds that are there are actually uh, a source of energy for those um, those bacteria and, and largely bacteria in the soil and so they'll start cleaving those things apart and so you'll end up with the carbon being used as an energy source you'll end up with some of the sulfur and nitrogen and other things that are in that that uh, compound being used by the microbe as food essentially and so the picture of that we've got there is a, a microbe called a chromobacter and that's been associated with glyphosate breakdown in the soil just uh, for an fyi but the real key thing you take home from from this slide here is that both of these processes require water in the system in order to function. And if you've got a system that is ab has water absent in it, then neither of these processes are going to go forward. Uh, we'll talk about the binding and uh, to organic matter and clay in the soil. And so essentially, this is our model soil on the right hand side, where we've got the brown bits are the solid portions in the soil. So that'll be your things like your um, sand, silt, clay, and organic matter that's in the soil. And then surrounding that where the blue is, water will create a film around each of those, um, those solid portions of the soil. And to a varying degrees, depending on where you are in the field capacity spectrum. So if you're whatever percent, if you're hundred percent of field capacity, you'll have a fairly substantial amount of blue, but you'll also have some of that gray area there and that's air in the soil. So that's a real key thing because a lot of the microbes that are, are breaking down herbicides in the soil are what we refer to as aerobic or oxygen loving uh, bacteria. And so they need those air spaces. And if you've got no air spaces in there, you're in a situation called an anaerobic situation. And there are the rare situations where you've got herbicides that break down faster under those conditions. An example of that is things like the group three herbicides like EDGE and trifluralin will break down very quickly under anaerobic conditions. And uh, any of the folks that kind of have sort of the gray hair like myself, uh, that saw trifluralin being used in canola systems prior to the introduction of our herbicide tolerant systems. If you had an application that was made in the fall and you had water laying in, in little puddles in the field, you would find that wild oats would come up in those puddles because essentially all the herbicide had broken down out of those areas because it was anaerobic and sitting there for a little period of time with water in it and the water recede and the wild oats came up. So the binding that takes place in this system is on to those solid particles in the soil. And again, that can determine the amount of stuff that's in the soil water for the microbes to break down, or it can actually protect your crop that's growing in that soil water from the herbicides that might be stuck to those um, components in the soil. There's another couple of minor pathways that some herbicides might utilize, but generally we compensate for that by the way that we apply them. Uh, photo degradation, again, group threes will break down. If you leave them on the soil surface, they'll break down by photo degradation as well and become deactivated. And Group threes and, and triolate um, are volatile as well. 
And so they'll gas off if left on the soil surface. And so that's why incorporation is important in getting good efficacy out of those herbicides. So let's zoom in a little closer and see what's going on at the microscopic level in these soils. So here's our boundary between our solid uh, portions of the soil and our, our water layer that's in there. And so this would be uh, representative of uh, relatively non-polar or only slightly polar herbicide in the soil uh, system. So what it means is that you've got a roughly equivalent amount that's bound to the soil or bound to the, that solid part as to how much you've got in that liquid layer that's on the outside of those solid bits. And this isn't irreversibly bound. What happens is that you've got movement going back and forth, and it's essentially just an equilibrium. So it sets up a balance in the soil, and it tries to maintain that balance as time goes on. And we'll, we'll show that in a little bit. So this is a relatively non-polar compound, whereas if you look at a very polar compound like glyphosate, most of what you've got in the soil is bound to that solid portion in the soil and very little of it is available in that soil water and not only for the microbes to break down but also the plants to take up by the roots and that's why we can apply glyphosate before we seed a crop and there's no concern about um, carryover in the soil affecting how that that crop grows now there's a bit of a limit to that and if we really push the application rate like let's say that you've got a spill of your favorite glyphosate product in the field, you may notice in that area that uh, crops will be inhibited where that spill was. And that's just because it's too concentrated in that area. And you kind of overcome this binding process um, to, that keeps the crop safe under your normal application rates. And then what happens is our little microbe guy comes along here and starts uh, chewing up that herbicide. And as he consumes the herbicide again that balance is tried to be maintained and more gets pulled off of that solid portion of the soil so we've got a happy microbe and we've got uh, no herbicide left in the soil and so that's our ideal condition and that's our non-residual herbicide residual herbicides though what comes into play is time and so the length of time they they need to break down is a little bit longer and so as our little microbes are going along and consuming, things start getting a bit cooler. We get into the fall and then all of a sudden what happens is the process stops and our poor little microbe is there and perishes for the winter, essentially goes into a form of dormancy for the winter. And so there is no breakdown over the winter when it's cold. So you biological activity stops at roughly five degrees and you'll get a little bit more progression of uh, the hydrolysis happening at less than five degrees, but it's very, very slow. And again, will largely stop when you lose free water and it turns to ice and when it drops below zero. So um, this is an example of that. And this comes from some work on uh, biobeds that was done by uh, Alan Cessna and Diane Knight and Tom Wolf. And uh, what they found, they were looking at the impact of having a bio bed sit out through the winter time and see what the breakdown pace would be. Um, and they had several of our more common herbicides here in Western Canada that they looked at. If you look at the very bottom, uh, metsulfuron or ally depends very, very heavily on hydrolysis. And so relative in the breakdown process there, it's less affected by temperature than some of the other products that are above it that are largely broken down by microbial activity. And so you can see there's a wide swing in the pace of breakdown when you have those microbial, those herbicides that are broken down through microbial activity. So an example of that is, is tribenuron is broken down through both microbial activity and through hydrolysis, at both working together at the same time. And, but even that one is, is stretched out by cool weather. So that blue bars are five degree sort of cut off for biological activity and, and what the impact of that cool weather is. And so that's why when we're looking at how is weather gonna impact our herbicide breakdown, we look at 
June, July, and August largely. And we don't really consider much the time prior to that in May and the time after that in September, October, and getting into fall. And that's largely because in May, the soil is still warming up from coming out of winter. And your, your microbial populations don't just like kick in all of a sudden. What they have to do is kind of build up over time and build their numbers up. And then they get to be very active once they have a, a essentially a raging population in the soil. And so that's the timeline where we get into our June 1 timeline as far as breakdown goes. Then in the fall, when we start getting our soils cooling off again, moving into winter, again, we get down into those red lines there where our soils are only at about 13 degrees and then start getting cooler as we get later and later in the fall into that five degree range. So when we have dry conditions in our model soil, what happens is that we run out of room for our little microbe friend to actually do his thing. And so we end up with no microbial activity taking place to break down those herbicides in the soil. And a lot of them get pushed a little bit more strongly onto those solid portions of the soil. Um, in this situation, you may get, a, again, a little bit of that hydrolysis taking place um, in that soil where you don't have the opportunity for microbial activity, but that may even be short term as well. Because when you get into very severe drought, then you get strong binding of those herbicides onto that solid portion of the soil and unavailable for breakdown through either pathway. And that's kind of what we had in a lot of areas for last year. And we'll look at our uh, prediction maps uh, here in a couple of minutes. So essentially, in two, we've over the last five years, we've had four of those years where we've had some kind of limitation on the ability of herbicides to break down predictably in the soil. And so the further we get into the red zone, the less predictable that breakdown is going to be. Uh, if we get into the green zone, we have really good predictability and it follows a rel relatively normal trend. But as soon as we get into that less than six inches of rainfall kind of area, that's when we start getting into inhibition of some of the breakdown that occurs in soil. And so you can see the maps there from 2018 and 2019. And if we look at some of the samples that came in in 2008, 2019 as a result of the 2000, no, 2018 as a result of the 2017 rainfall patterns is essentially what we're looking at. Um, we can see where all of those, we plot them on the map and we see where all those cases fell. And so we can see that a lot of our uh, things like um, Odyssey, uh, Aries, Viper, and things like that uh, only occurred in the really sort of brownish type zones, brown or red, essentially, or orange or red or whatever you want to call it. And we also had situations where we had heat carrying over that was unexpected. Um, in, and we also had some damage to chickpea that we thought was responsible from, from heat. Usually heat breaks down fairly quickly, but uh, in these situations, we weren't getting rainfall and, and the heat just kind of hung around until we got a big rainfall. So uh, we've got the odd outlier here on the east side of the province. But what I really want to look at is uh, the things that are along the east or east side of the province from the top to the bottom. So things like Everest uh, or Fukarba zone, uh, curtail M with the clopyrrolid in it, um, um, the pyrosulfatol that's in infinity. Those things require a bit more moisture than some of the those IMIs that um, are used in pulse crops. And so those need almost six inches to get some reasonably predictable breakdown um, in your soil. So every herbicide has a different sort of moisture zone that will impact it. And so that's why we have our map broken down into those various zones. And the further you get into the red or orange, the more of those herbicides are gonna be affected by that, uh, that weather pattern. 
So these are the risk patterns for 2021 and 2022. And for next year, we can see that there's a big chunk of the province on the west side of the province or west half of the province even that are at a fairly high risk of uh, carryover from a large cross-section of those herbicides that, uh, that can carry over in soil. And if we look at the division between the brown and the yellow and the map on the right-hand side, that's essentially the number that BSF is using for their cutoff point for a lot of soils. And so essentially that 125 millimeters of rainfall. So anything that's brown or brown, orange, or red will fall into that recropping category that BSF is talking about, right? In the yellow, you're outside of that zone. And in the green, you're outside of that zone. Um, you'll notice that there is some. Uh, green patches that run through the east side of the southeast part of the province there. And essentially that, that was a single thunderstorm that ran through in July that hit a bunch of those areas. So if you're in those areas and you've got that thunderstorm, then you're probably going to be in pretty good shape for uh, carryover going forward into next year. Um, and if your crops didn't look like they were suffering terrifically from drought last year. Uh, because we had next to no soil res reservoir of moisture, if you had fairly non-droughted crops out there, then they were getting adequate moisture and your, your microbes in the soil were getting adequate moisture to do their jobs as well. So that's another signal as to what to kind of look for uh, for herbicide care. Now, the other thing that you want to kind of take notice of as well, particularly in the southwest of the province, is overlap from 2001 and 2002 risk. So we've got some situations that if you've got a multi-year restriction on a product and it was applied in, let's say, 2020, but there wasn't sufficient rainfall to break down then, in a lot of cases, you have to add another year of restriction to that crop, even though you get you got rain in, in 2021, say. Um, and the same applies if you've got two back-to-back -back years of those suboptimal breakdown conditions, you may have to add two years to that recropping cycle in order to make sure that your crop is going to be safe. And that's not exactly something that everybody wants to hear, uh, but that's just the way that's the hand that mother nature has dealt us in these situations. So if we look at these areas down here, we've got back-to-back -back years of less than um, 100 millimeters of rainfall, which is essentially encompasses all of the, the residual herbicides and there, that would be the absolute minimum amount of rainfall that would be required to get something broken down. And then in these areas here, you've had back-to-back -back years of less than that 75 millimeters of rainfall. And so those are really severe risk conditions. And you essentially in those areas had no breakdown for two years back-to-back. -back. So those are things to kind of watch for um, and kind of take into account when you're, you're gauging your, your recropping options for next year. So again, how is this going to affect our crop? There is a pretty high risk across most of Saskatchewan going into 2022 for some type of extended carryover of those herbicides in the soil. And essentially what that means is that our predictability is really on the low side. So nobody's going to be really certain about what's, what's going to get nailed and what's not going to get nailed. And so that's a good reason to be relatively conservative about your, your cropping. The other thing is, is that the rainfall that we did get in a lot of cases was confined to essentially kind of a early June, I think it was about June 9th was the rainfall. And then we had some that was like the third week in August where we had a rainfall with a lot of nothing in between. And so the June rainfall would have produced some breakdown, but then as soon as the soils dry up again, that breakdown would stop. And then when the August rainfall comes along, it has to sort of reboot that system again and get it going again after that extended period of, of warm, dry conditions. So 
that may limit the functionality of those microbes in the soil, especially. And any of those little rainfalls that you get that are less than, say, oh, a tenth um, or a couple of tenths of an inch, essentially they're just going to wet the soil surface for an hour and then it's going to dry up right away when you've got really dry soils. And so those are really not going to contribute a whole lot to uh, breakdown. Um, so that I think is something to kind of keep in mind is that the maps that we've got here are the total accumulation of rainfall and even including some of those little showers that were uh, in that system uh, going forward. The other thing in the brown soils to consider is that, that those BASF restrictions also include if you had any one of those months in June, July, or August, and in our case this year, we're probably looking at July, uh, where you had less than 15 millimeters of rainfall, regardless of how much you accumulated on the other side of that, you've got recropping challenges as well. And so you may want to extend some of those more sensitive recropping options another year. And so what I would suggest is, is take a look at our guide to crop protection that will probably be coming out in early March, late February, early March. And have a look at some of the new restrictions because some of those have even changed since September when those letters came out warning people about recropping options and some of the even normal recropping options under normal moisture conditions have changed for some of those products as well. So you, we want to go and have a look at um, those products in the guide and, and essentially the range of products has kind of expanded as well in the sense that um, that letter didn't really mention uh, herbicides like altitude for clear filled wheat. Um, didn't mention things like oats and um, and like mustards and things like that. So there's been a few changes there. So go have a look at that when it comes out. Um, so yeah, again, we have to be really conservative and select the essentially the most tolerant crop going into next year. And what that is going to involve is consulting with your agronomist, your local agronomist and the manufacturer as to what they're comfortable with, with the amount of rainfall that you got on your farm. The other thing to kind of keep in mind with these prediction maps is that they're all based on a series of points. And some of our points are closer in some areas than they are in others because we rely on crop reporter rainfall records. And there are some RMs that don't have that. And then all those fancy curves and things like that, they're all generated by a computer based on those points on that map. And so you can't take that map and point to it and say, well, I live right there and be able to say how much moisture you got. Your own records are gonna be the best gauge of what rainfall you did get. So also keep that in mind. So how bad is it? How can you find out? Usually companies are pretty good about keeping on top of this. When there is a drought, they update their labels and, and put restrictions on those. So products that have been around for quite a while, they're usually uh, kept up to date. Um, and one thing that does happen from time to time is when we do get a relatively new product that was introduced during one of those wet cycles, we don't really have a good feel for how it's going to uh, persist under our conditions. And so we may have one of those that pops up every once in a while. And we had that last year in some places with uh, clomazone or command uh, showed up injuring some cereals with the uh, bleaching symptoms last year. And I'll show you some of these later on. Uh, but generally companies keep their, their information up to date and can advise pretty, pretty easily. Um, kind of the default on the label is the field bioassay. And essentially what that means is that you have to take a strip and run it through your field of a crop that you're interested in or however many crops you're interested in for that field and then see how it grows and take it through the season to yield to figure out whether you've got um, residue in there or not. Challenges with that is it doesn't help you this year coming. It helps you in 2023. So that one's a, really not that practical. Um, the other thing that is pretty critical in that process is that you need to check strip. You need an area where that herbicide wasn't. 
And with our um, improved application practices now with very little overlap and, and very little gap in the field that are sort of our, our self-made uh, check strips, we don't have those anymore. And so we don't have any check areas in the field to say, well, this is what it would be growing like without the herbicide in the system. And so sometimes you'll get fields that have been split between crops and have residual non-residual products in there and you get lucky that way. But if you have a full field that's, that's uh, in the residual product and you don't have any checks in there, then it's pretty hard to tell. Uh, we have really great technology now for chemical analysis. You can send your soil into a, a lab and they can send you back a nice piece of paper with a nice number on it that says, this is how absolutely how much of that herbicide you have in the soil. But the problem is, is that that analysis doesn't tell you what you can grow. And there's very few people that can tell you with any certainty what you can grow either, because essentially the companies one have all that data and they'll be able to say, oh yeah, well, below X value and less you, yeah, you'll be safe and no above value Y and above you won't be safe. But there's a great big area in between that because of that binding capacity of the soil, you won't get a certain answer one way or the other. Nobody, so essentially will err on the, the conservative side. And it used to be the case, but maybe not so much anymore because our technology has improved that group twos used to be in a situation where they were active below where you could detect them. And so the plants were better at detecting the herbicide than the, the process was. But some of that has improved over time. We did have a process called a lab bioassay. And essentially what you did is you took your soil sample, you sent it off to the lab. And essentially what they did is they took that, put it in a, a tray and a greenhouse they grew this stuff out and they would tell you what whether you had herbicide injury or not depending on the crop that went in there um, you also have to have a check with that so you have to pull some soil from somewhere where you didn't spray with that herbicide and so you would get results in about four to six weeks challenges you have to have thought of that last fall to be able to get, dig that soil up and send it into the lab because it's going to be a pretty tough dig right now at minus 30. Um, the other thing about that is that there's a bit of error in there. Um, and the, one of the risks that's in there is the error of a false negative where the lab comes back and says, yep, safe to grow everything that, that we planted in there. And you go out and you plant it in your field and you get injury and you go, what the heck? Well, that's a risk that a lot of labs are not willing to take, um, because it's going to cost money when you come back and you say, well, I want my pound of flesh and I want some compensation for this. And so as a result, nobody offers this right now. And, and the other part of that is it's super infrastructure intensive and you only use that infrastructure maybe once or twice every 10 years. So what do you do with it in the meantime? You've got all this investment in this infrastructure and nobody's using it for anything. So um, that's why a lot of labs drop this, this assay and don't use it anymore. Now the U of S has developed another process that's less intensive on the infrastructure. And essentially you're growing this stuff in um, what's called a growth pouch. And it's essentially this little, looks like an eight by five envelope that's kind of hanging like a full a file folder in a, in a filing cabinet in this little tray and you've got them all lined up and they're all growing in a very relatively small area. Um, this one hasn't been picked up by any labs, but as a result of some of the talks that I did in the fall on this, there is a lab that has gotten contact with Dr. Shano's lab, who Dr. Shano at the U of S is the one that developed that, that uh, um, assay process. And they're, I'm not sure how the discussions have gone, but maybe they've gone positively and maybe they'll be offering it here in, the, in future years. But at this point, we don't know of anybody that's offering it. So um, it shows promise. And this is kind of what it looks like. So essentially what you've got here is our, um, you've got your root length and that's what they base it on. 
So we've got zero over here on the left-hand side. And then as your rate of herbicide goes up, then you've got shorter and shorter roots. And that's how, what they measure. And that's how they tell whether you've got residue in your soil or not. And this is mustard. Uh, they also do, um, they also did peas uh, with Everest. And so in this situation here, you'll notice in this one with three parts per billion that it's, uh, um, I'm not sure how I get rid of that line. That could be a problem. So anyway, so the, the peas at the three parts per billion, they had uh, injury at the top part that wasn't reflected in the root. So you kind of have to pay attention to both in that case. So other symptoms to look for uh, in your field, if you've got group two injury and you've got a grass crop growing there, one of the key things is uh, intervenal yellowing down at the, the base of the leaf. And essentially what's going on is that that leaf when it grows, grows from the bottom outward and it pushes that older tissue up. And so where you've got a green tip, there was no exposure to the herbicide, but then you'll get a rainfall, it liberates that herbicide, makes it available for the plant to take up. And then you see the bottom of that leaf start to show symptoms where that leaf has been trying to grow through that herbicide in the soil. And so the other thing that you can see it, uh, in a lot of cases is, let's try this, is uh, you get tillers that have tried to initiate and then they just kind of get stunted and they really don't progress much past this little stubby kind of part. You get overall stunting of both roots and shoots. And, and here's another good picture here actually of what it looks like up close. And what we end up with is uh, a distortion of the, the ratio between the leaf blade, which is the portion the green portion here and the leaf sheath which is the white portion at the bottom of the leaf and so if you look at these ones that are the newer growth on that plant on the left hand side you'll note that the sheath is relatively long and then you've got this little wee stubby leaf blade on the top of it and that's so the main growing point is doing that that tiller that's come along is doing that and what you may see is actually also a proliferation of new tillers down at the bottom, but then they get stunted and stopped as well. So it's, uh, and that's because of something called a loss of apical dominance. And that's what we're seeing in that middle picture there, those chickpeas. The normal ones are on the left-hand side and you can see, yeah, there's the odd branch here and there. But when you've got group twos in the symptom in the system, you've got a loss of apical dominance. And apical dominance essentially means that that main growing point up at the top is controlling all those lateral buds that are on the plant as you go down the plant. And the further that that top gets away, the more inclined those bottom buds are to start to branch. In a normal situation, let's say something comes along and eats that top bud off, the next one down steps up and it starts to take over and be the dominant bud in that case. In these cases here, all the buds are being uh, suppressed and you're getting branches coming from every spot along that stem, a lot being pushed out from the nodes down here at the base of the plant. And so it, uh, it can be problematic that way. Um, Dallas, do you know how I get rid of this green line here that I drew? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess folks are, I'm not almost done here, so I guess we'll, we'll kind of tolerate it. Uh, oddly enough, the green line kind of goes through the right spot here. So those peas on the right-hand side there, um, they were growing along fine. It was dry, but they were growing along quite nicely until there was a great big rainfall right about where that line intersects the stem. And then after that, the areas, the distance between the leaf nodes along that stem start getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And that essentially means that that plant is picking up more and more of the herbicide as time goes on until you get right up to the very top of the plant and you've essentially got a really insignificant distance between those, those branches or those, those leaves on the stem. The other thing to kind of note is that if you look along each of the those areas where the leaves come out or the tendrils come out, 
and you look in the in the axle of that or the crotch where that uh, leaf is you'll notice that every single one of those crotches has new growth coming in it and that again is that loss of apical dominance so that top bud isn't controlling those bottom buds anymore and they're all starting to kind of go like this well we got to grow and kind of keep things moving along here so that is part of the challenge that that we can see is and again generally it's it's a fairly substantial rainfall that triggers that injury in that, that sensitive crop. Uh, group three, um, the thing that we're looking at in that case, everything that's going on there is, is associated with the soil. It's below ground, essentially. Um, so you either get clubbing of the root where the root tip is inhibited. And so you end up with a whole bunch of buildup of tissue right at the tip of that, that root once you get exposure. Um, you can also, like the one on the left there, you can get some suppression of that, that coleoptil on that uh, grass plant, uh, the thing that encloses the, the leaves when they're penetrating through the soil. And so you can get that as well uh, happening uh, with residues in the soil of things like edge and, and trifluralin and things like that. Group four, uh, again, group four is essentially like the plant's natural um, compound that's used for apical dominance. And so essentially um, what happens in those cases is that you overload that hormonal system and you've got a whole bunch of growth that doesn't get direction from the plant. And that's what's going on in the last side, the left-hand side there with that uh, swollen bit that's splitting the stem open. You're getting a whole bunch of cells that don't know what they want to be when they grow up. And they just keep growing and growing and growing until they just cut the top of the stem off from the root. And so that's essentially your death component. You get all your decoration happening, like the, the leaves in the center there that uh, are cupped. Um, and in this case here, we also had... Um, some thickening of those leaves, like uh, it made it look kind of like a Christmas cactus kind of kind of thing. Groups five and seven, those are largely contact products. Um, they're the ones that are active in the soil. Group six isn't, so you're not going to get issues with group six, um, but you might with a residual uh, membrane disruptor of, of another type, and we'll talk about that in a second. Essentially what you end up with is with that grass plant on the left-hand side, these compounds may not be enough to kill that plant outright, but because they only move up in the stem, they move up to the tip of the leaf with the soil water and they concentrate up at that end point of the leaf. And then you get necrotic tissue or dead tissue showing up at the tip of that leaf. Similarly with broadleaf fluids, what happened or broadleaf plants, what happens is that that material moves up in the plant into the outer edges of the leaf first, and you'll start seeing die back from the edge of the leaf back in towards the center of the leaf. And your veins will stay green, but the areas that are in between the veins will start to yellow off and start to go necrotic. <clears throat> Group 13 is a bleaching compound. That's your command or uh, clomazone. And what you get with this one is, again, when you get a rainfall to liberate it, it uh, causes a lack of pigment production. And so you'll end up with white tissues and occasionally you'll get the, the, that purple that's in that center bit there. That purple is just what's called anthocyanin. That's a stress compound in that plant. So yeah, that's just a signal that the plant is crying for help. And the picture on the left there shows that this stuff, because it's a soil active herbicide, it's impacted by the soil characteristics in that field. And so it'll be in lighter soils, lower organic matter soils, things like that will show injury before some of the other heavier soils in that, in that field. So that's the thing to look for with, with that one. The other thing to know, note again is that the tip is green. And so essentially what's happened in that case is that the plant has been growing along fine. And then all of a sudden you've got a rainfall that's liberated that, that stuff that's been stuck to the soil. And then now from that sort of line on the leaf downward, because the leaf is growing from the bottom, you've got that pale tissue because the plant can't form pigments or uh, 
or chlorophyll as a result. Group 14, again, similar to group five and seven in the sense that it breaks apart membranes and desiccates things really quickly. Um, in this case, though, what we see sometimes is you can get the same thing as group five and seven, where it's on the edge of the leaf and it moves upward in the plant. And what it may do is it may move upward in the plant at low concentrations at night, concentrate at the edge of the leaves. And then when the sun comes up in the daytime, it triggers the activity of it. You get necrosis at the edge of the leaf. In some cases, though, if you get a little higher concentrations coming up during the daytime hours, you can get necrosis of the veins themselves because the sun is shining on there. These things work very quickly once the sun shines on them. That material moving up in that vein, it activates right away as soon as it gets in that vein and then it starts causing that necrosis. Group 15 um, and actually uh, group eight is now what we would normally call group eight herbicides are now in that group 15 category. And, Fair enough, this, the, the symptom similarities is, are kind of the same. In that left-hand picture, that, that darker green or almost blue-green plant there, that's suffering from the herbicide, whereas the one in the middle that has the lighter green tissues is healthier and, and is not being affected as much by the herbicide. And on the right-hand picture, what we've got there is that leaf that's kind of shooting out to the left-hand side what happens is it, it's a concept called onion leafing where the edges of those leaves kind of curl in on themselves on a longitudinal axis and you end up with something that looks like an onion leaf. That's why we call it onion leafing. Um, the other thing that we can end up getting is that that tip of the leaf gets stuck in the sheath of the leaf before it and will go up in a big loop and around and that's called buggy whipping. And we'll get that in these comp with when we have injury from these compounds as well. With uh, broadleaf weeds, what we end up with is if you take the leaf and you look at where the stem goes down through the middle of that leaf, you'll get what looks like somebody's just pulled a string and the and the tip of that leaf is kind of pulled back like that. And you'll get wrinkling up here at the tip, and you'll get that tip of the leaf being pulled down in the middle. And that's kind of the symptomology we'll get in a broadleaf plant. And group 27, another bleacher. This one's only mobile upward in the plant. Again, very much like the group five and group sevens. They're only going upward in the plant. And so that's when you start getting that halo that you see on the outside of the leaf where you get that white starting to show up. Below that one point, that's a, that's a good indicator of where this plant was exposed, where you've got that very thin layer on the outside of the leaves. Those were leaves that were formed before that plant got exposed. So just the very edge is affected, but the leaves above that point, essentially where that green line intersects the plant, um, that's where you start getting any of the newer, newer leaves or have less and less chlorophyll in them and less and less color in them. <clears throat> and that's continuing ongoing exposure from that, that herbicide in the soil. So things to not confuse with herbicide injury is things like moisture deficiency. And so what we get when we have moisture deficiency in, uh, in, the, in, in cereal plants in particular, but it does reflect similarly in broadleaf plants, is that the older leaves will start to yellow off, dry off, and drop off. And essentially that's that plant starting to prune leaves off of the bottom that are less productive than upper leaves in the plant. So they start pruning them off because they're just a source of moisture loss. They get rid of them. The other thing that they'll do is they'll start putting on a heavier wax layer that makes the plant have more of a gray blue hue to it. The other thing they'll do is when they're growing new leaves, they'll, the leaves will be shorter than normal and they'll be tilted upward to try and when the sun's up here, you don't want any like if your leaf is sitting like that, you get more exposure to the heat of the sun. Whereas if you put your leaf up like that, then you minimize that heat exposure to the sun and you lose less moisture that way. So those are the kinds of symptoms that you'll see with um, moisture stress. They do resemble in grass plants, they do resemble group four injury in grass plants as well. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. 
is that because of that cell growth at the bottom of that grass plant, they're not immune to the effect, but they can tolerate it better, grasses can. And so as a result, what you end up with is a, a bit of a restriction of moisture going from the roots up to the top and you get a, a bit of a simulated moisture uh, stress symptomology in those plants as well. So essentially, our major routes of degradation rely on moisture. We didn't have a whole lot. So that means we didn't get very predictable breakdown. And in some cases, maybe not a whole lot of breakdown at all. Um, we had well below normal moisture conditions in the west side of the province and below moisture can below normal moisture conditions in the rest of the province by and large. And you've got variability in pHs kind of kicking in there. Um, I wouldn't waste money on getting a, a lab test done to find out how much stuff you've got in there because nobody can tell you what it means. And lab bioassays are more reliable, but nobody does them. And so essentially you have to be really conservative about your cropping decisions for next year and just be really careful. And if you, if you don't stay conservative, you'll essentially be rolling the dice on your crop that you're putting in and what's the most expensive crop and the one that re returns the most money, that's going to be your canola crops are going to probably be at highest risk, especially from group two carryover. And that wraps me up for today. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Clark. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Sure. Um, I will just jump right into them since we're right at two o'clock here. Um, our friend, Aaron Willenberg. Uh, hi, Aaron. Uh, we're going to ask, uh, could the changes uh, to the guide be called out in a summary? I believe that uh, she's referring to the um a crop protection guide or do we need to look through each product and compare to the 2021 guide to find the differences um uh, what i would have to kind of pull that up somehow to try and essentially kind of ferret that out so if we've got some patience if you want to go on with the next question i'll pull okay. that up while we're uh while i'm trying to um sure yeah i'll ask the next question pull here. that up so the next question is in some areas here in the southwest we had places that had three to four inches of rainfall this fall and we did have an extended warm fall would this have helped with our herbicide breakdown quite a, a bit still more than probably normal um the challenge is that predicting what that breakdown would have been is going to be dodgy because even though we had an extended fall that still kind of cools off a little bit September was pretty good but October things started cooling down again and kind of getting into that normal pattern um, so we may have gotten a little bit more breakdown out of September than we would normally expect uh, but again it's it's about predicting whether we can get away with that or not and outside of those lab bioassays there's no really real way to tell what's going on in those in those systems so there hasn't been an, the, the real challenge with doing research on drought conditions is that they don't happen all the time and by the time we get funding in place and researchers set up the, the the research funding cycle is such that it takes you two years to kind of get into the research and by the time that happens the drought's gone so we don't have a lot of good drought research and how some of these little tweaks kind of happen and essentially the companies are setting these guidelines on their herbicides based on the records that they've got from previous years of it being used in real practice. The other thing that's a challenge is that you can't always predict when these injuries are going to show up in that in some cases where you think it should be obvious that it's, it's going to show up, it doesn't. And then other areas where you think, well, I'm okay to go, you get injury showing up. So it's, it's not always that predictable as to where these things are going to, 
rear their ugly heads and usually it's on farmland and and that's that's the only way that we can kind of gather that that information on on how that stuff proceeds okay uh, another question here from david uh, will volunteer weeds such as canola in the fall be a good indicator if you might have residual herbicide carryover. And he has a second uh, part here. Example, volunteer Liberty Link and Roundup Ready Canola was in abundance in late September in a pea field sprayed with Viper. This should indicate that there is little or no risk of residual carryover. Um, I wouldn't, I, yeah, I'd be really leery about taking that as an absolute sign that you're not going to have a problem um it may just simply be that that herbicide layer has not moved down into that rooting zone sufficiently to be lethal to that plant whereas next spring it may be in that zone where it's more lethal because of that fall rainfall so it's it a, it might be an indicator. So if you go in this spring, let's say, and you're not getting stinkweed growth, you're not getting, and make sure your stinkweed isn't group two resistant, but you're not, and you're not getting volunteer canola growth coming that you would normally expect to see in the springtime. That's probably a good indicator that you've got residues in that soil that are gonna be problematic. Um, I think, and you answered this one. Can you comment on the sensitivity of different crops to group two herbicide carryover? Uh, you did that. Yeah. Uh, areas of the province had rainfall and relatively warm temperatures in October. Uh, yeah, I think you uh, covered that one uh, quite well. Um, we can go back to Aaron's question if you want. Sure. Yeah. If you've got, uh, got yeah. that one. So. Okay, so essentially what we've got um, with that, with, let's, let's go to just the standalone Amazomox products. So that'll be things like Solo and any co-packs with that, like Solo Ultra and things, um, as well as Altitude. And the other thing you kind of have to, watch for is that you may get a bit of a difference between how Corteva responds to their ME versus how BSF is responding to their ME. And each is going to have a different set of data that they can pull from. So there may be some subtle differences that way. Um, but anyway, if we get to sort of the normal recropping, essentially canary seed comes out of that um, can be recropped going and durum wheat uh, comes out of the normal recropping option falling just to Mazamox. Um, as and so what we have now for the regular recropping cycle is the pulses like field pea lentil, clear fruit canola, oats, barley, corn, chickpea, soybean, and spring wheat in the first season after under normal rainfall conditions. And then in the second year after application, so let's say you put it on in 2020, you would wait, not put them in in 2021, but to, into 2022, you've got flax, canola, canary seed, durum, and sunflower can be seeded in those situations. Where our restrictions come in and sort of how this reads now, so in any soil zone where you've got less than 125 millimeters, or in the brown soils where you have less than 15 millimeters in any one of those months of June, July, or August, you will have to look, and that's irrespective of how much rainfall you got in total over those three months. You will want to delay planting oats by an additional year. And you will want to delay planting non-clear field canola uh, 
for an additional year. And that also, if you get drought conditions in the year of application or in the following year, the year following application in that situation where you're waiting from 2020 to 2022 to grow canola and you get a dry year in the middle of that, then you have to add another year, regardless of which year you got your dry period. So if you got two years back to back of dry, what does that mean? They haven't really provided any guidance on that, but it may mean that to be on the safe side, you may need to back that up another year for a year for each significant drought year or less than 125 millimeters that you've gotten. Now with, oh no, that, sorry, I take that back. That was for Odyssey, that restriction. For the Amazimox standalone, So the normal recropping is winter wheat can be seeded three months after application. So essentially the fall after application. Um, barley, canary seed, canola, chickpea, field corn, field pea, flax, lentils, oats, sunflower, and spring wheat, including Durham, can be seeded the first season after application and then tame mustard the second season after application. Now, under that same moisture um, criterion that we had for the Odyssey products. So less than 125 millimeters over all soil zones or less than 15 millimeters in any month in July or August for regardless of in the brown soil zones, regardless of whether you got 125 mils, more than 125 mils or not. What that means is that delay planting canary seed, canola, non-clear field canola, flax, tame oats, or non-clear field durum wheat or winter wheat by an additional year. And then if you have the same drought conditions that we just described, in either year before planting mustard, you have to add an additional year there as well. And again, we don't know what that means if you get two back-to-back -back years of drought in that, in the year of application or the end the year after, what that means for mustard, we don't know. Okay. okay. So that, that one that I just did, that'll be on altitude, solo, viper, and then the one that I read first will be on Odyssey products. And the other thing that producers need to keep in mind is that just because the BSF label isn't on the jug that they put down, doesn't mean that they're out of the woods and they may not have gotten notice from their manufacturer if they're using a generic product. So that's the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that the generic products by and large are not great at supporting after sales stuff. And they may not have the infrastructure to be able or wherewithal really, because they don't have the data package. They've essentially said, okay, well, uh, we're just like that. So we wanna get that label and we're gonna go run with that. So they don't necessarily have the data package that BSF has as a proprietary manufacturer of that product to be able to make predictive things happen like BSF has. That makes sense. Makes sense to me. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Great. I uh, have a few more questions. We're just going to get to sure. the questions that are here, and then um, I'll uh, we'll have to cut it off there. So sure. um, the the next question here: uh, Does Group Fifteen herbicides need to be incorporated? I'm specifically referring to pyrosulfone. Peroxisulfone? Peroxisulfone? Okay. Peroxisulfone, yeah. Um, Peroxisulfone doesn't, but you have to be careful of the, the active ingredient that you're talking about. Um, and sometimes you can kind of break them down into chemical families, but um, the ones that are volatile, like trilate, 
now is in group 15. It used to be in group eight, but it's now in group 15. Something that's volatile like that needs some type of incorporation in order to retain its activity and not just gas off into the atmosphere and be gone. Same thing for, for EPTAM. So EPTC, same family as Trilate. That one there needs even more aggressive incorporation in order to function properly because it's it gases off even more than that. But peroxisulfone isn't volatile. So it can sit on the soil surface, not go anywhere and wait for rainfall to come along in order to incorporate it. Now that presents a whole another question as to whether, what do you do if you don't get rain after you've applied it? Um, some in that group 15 family have a provision where you can go in with like a, a rotary hoe and scuffle the soil a little bit and kind of get a little bit of turnover so that you can at least get some of that herbicide down, like let's say half an inch into the soil so that you get some activity there. Um, I think peroxisulfone is such that they don't recommend that. Um, but yeah, talk to the company as to what you do in a, in a drought and what they would recommend. And that's one of the advantages to putting something like peroxisulfone or sulfentrazone on in the fall in, in Western Canada is that you, you're a little more certain to get some type of moisture for incorporating that into the, the germination zone of those weeds. Uh, with your your meltwater, fall rains, things like that. So there's a little more safety in that. If you're in a wet cycle, maybe not so much, but in the dry cycle for sure. Okay. Uh, Corey Leeson has a question. Uh, thoughts on potential for Vero carryover uh, to both lentil and canola? Um, I would suggest that um, with Vero, it's one of those shorter persistence, but then again, so is Amazomox. Um, if you're in one of those really deep red zones, I would be really cautious of that one and start talking to the company about, well, are you gonna stand behind this crop or should I just avoid it? Again, discussions with the manufacturer or the herbicide are very important in this process because they're the ones that have the data. They are the ones that know absolutely what's going to happen with their product. And if they're confident and they say, yeah, go ahead and plant canola on your old vero ground. Um, yeah, maybe your response is, that's awesome. Can you send me that in an email? Have something in writing that says that somebody from the company told you to do that or that it was okay to do that. If there's any kind of question about whether it's safe to do so. So I think that's the real key thing this year is to make sure you got all your bases covered. Okay. Uh, and our final question here, Jenny Seward. Many chickpea growers are planning on growing chickpeas on solo stubble because they are somewhat tolerant. That's the question. Okay. Um, that's probably gonna be a safer bet than in Durham for sure. Um, most of the, most of the pulse crops are very, very tolerant to residues in the soil. There will have been some breakdown that has taken place, but just not enough that we can predict some of those more sensitive crops, whether they're going to be able to tolerate it or not. And that's kind of what that, what this, the, the recropping challenge is this year, if you've got like the really tolerant crops like chickpeas on, on Amy ground and on solo ground, then you're, you're probably have planting one of the more safer crops to grow. 